considering that the Shakespeare's first poem cycles, Venus and Adonis and Lucrece, were bestsellers and that soon in the following years, many more editions were printed. You may ask yourself, why? Shakespeare's sonnets did not become a bestseller? Why? After the first edition of Shakespeare's sonnets in 1609, it took a whole generation to print a completely rearranged and modified type of second edition of Shakespeare's sonnets, in 1640. There clearly must be logical reasons for this, and there are many more unanswered questions. Let's think about some of those essential questions, and about this unusual, strange situation. Who had the background knowledge? and authority, to do that? At first note, that this second edition of Shakespeare's sonnets was published in 1640, by a certain obscure publisher, John Benson. Who was this rather obscure figure? John Benson? Can we really rely, on what encyclopedias tell us today about this publisher? Note that the first engraving of Shakespeare in the first folio, was accompanied by a strange epistle of the editor, Ben Johnson, asking the reader, not to look on his picture, but his book. Was it really pure coincidence? Or could it be a literary hoax, that the name of the editor of the poems corresponded to a reversal or mirroring of the editor of the first folio? John Benson? Ben Johnson? The question must be permitted. Since in the poems of the second edition of the sonnets in 1640, also Shakespeare's engraving was reversed, that is mirrored. Reminding one to the simultaneous reversing, or mirroring, of the editor's name, Ben Johnson, to John Benson. Let us substantiate, why the portrait of Shakespeare is not only ridiculed but why the poem associated with this engraving, tells us directly and straightforward, that the depicted person does by no means correspond to the renowned poet genius Shakespeare. The beginning of the poem, candidly explains, that not the depicted person, but only the shadow, belongs to the renowned poet Shakespeare. Listen. This shadow is renowned Shakespeare's. Soul of the age, the applause. Delight. The wonder of the stage. Thus, only the shadow, and in no way the depicted person itself, belongs to renowned Shakespeare, and the shadow, contrary to physical laws, is conspicuously brightened. But this terrific burlesque, or farce, doesn't end here. How else? Do we learn, that this man is not a poet? Remember. A laurel wreath, worn on the head, like Ben Jonson's here, symbolized a renowned poet, since that time termed, a poet laureate. Note, that the title figure on the poems, written by Will. Shake hyphen Spear, gentlemen, does not bear a laurel wreath on his forehead, but instead, clearly holds the laurel in his hand. Obviously for somebody else. For whom? For his faked shadow? Remember. This mock-up was allowed, to decorate the true poet. Listen. Nature herself, was proud of, his, designs and joy to wear the dressing of, his, lines. Who, in 1640, composed these knowledgeable satirical verses? John Benson? Can the alleged editor, John Benson, really have had the background knowledge, to invent and introduce such a mighty satire? Consider, that the editor rearranged and merged the sonnets into new and longer poem groups, altered the order, gave them descriptive titles, 
they formerly had only numbers, omitted eight sonnets, that is number 18 1943 56 75 76 96 and 126, removed some textual features etc. Ask yourself. Is there any motive? Why at the beginning of the poems an editor John Benson? If he was not a pseudonym of the author himself. Plunged into the middle of Shakespeare's sonnet quarto? And started with the intimate personal sonnet group, number 67, 68 and 69, newly entitled, The Glory of Beauty? A motive immediately becomes recognizable, but only, if one accepts the Marlowe Shakespeare authorship thesis. As a result, the true poet genius in the late 1630s must have been still alive. Marlowe himself rearranged the poems, or former sonnets, this time by beginning with the sonnet group 67 to 69, which summarizes metaphorically its inner connections to his past personal life situation. The title, The Glory of Beauty, is highly allegoric. One perhaps better would call it, The Lost Beauty of Glory. Let's regard, exemplarily, a few lines of each sonnet of this first poem the glory of beauty, and give it a meaning. Consider that similar conclusions could have easily been done for the entire poem. Sonnet 67 asks, why should a false painting imitate his cheek, and steal dead seeing of his living hue? In plain language. The cheek of the engraving in 1623, as well as in 1640, was faked. Note the chin line. And clearly reveals the mask of Shakespeare, covering and concealing the true, living author, Shakespeare allegorically had stolen his dead appearance, his living hue. Sonnet 68, directly and straightforwardly states, that the right of sepulchres were shorn away, to live a second life on second head. In plain language. Because the poet genius Marlowe, alias Shakespeare, due to a given promise and for life-saving reasons, had to abandon his name and identity, he early was aware of the fact, that he could not get a normal, identifiable tomb at his demise, but was forced to constantly live a concealed second life, on a second head, that is, with others' identities and names. The selected lines of Sonnet 69 ask. To thy fair flower, add the rank smell of weeds, but why thy odor matches not thy show? In plain language, the lines openly explain, that the smell of an offensive person, Shakespeare from Stratford, a false identity, was added to his odor. And that is the actual reason for an obvious mismatch between his own poetical sweetness and the corrupt appearance of a smell, or show, of somebody else. Since these lines appeared already in Shakespeare's sonnets in 1609, you should seriously consider the possibility, that we have here an early, contemporaneous disclosure of a yet unrecognized authorship problem. Many more examples of conspicuous allegoric discrepancies similar to those in this poem between false painting of a cheek 67, between a first and second life 68, between a mismatch of an odor and an offensive smell 69. A highly revealing, 
in the dedicatory verses of rather unknown, dubious poetical figures, such as Leonard Diggis, James Mabb, or John Warren. Let's briefly reflect some lines. Note. It seems almost unbelievable. Diggis and Mab contributed commendatory verses, both, to the first folio, as well as, seventeen years later in 1640, to the second edition of Shakespeare's sonnets. Diggis closed his dedicatory lines in the first folio in 1623, by emphasizing. Be sure, our Shakespeare, thou canst never die, but crowned with laurel, live eternally. You may ask yourself. Why on earth, even in 1640, Shakespeare was not crowned with laurel but instead, Diggis concluded. Some second Shakespeare must tough Shakespeare right. For me, it is needless, since an host of men will pay to clap his praise, to free my pen. Note the ambiguous meaning of host, as an entertainer, or a sacrifice. In plain language, Diggis, alias the poet genius, is revealing, in a roundabout way, that his second identity was forced to write for him. For him as a host, that is the entertainer as well as the victim or sacrifice of his first identity, Marlowe. In the end, all is needless. It's his second identity, Will, William Shakespeare, who will pay off his literary praise, or success and free him, his pen, from his blame. Can anybody really accept, that a quarter of a century after Shakespeare's death, the name Shakespeare, three times written in this short poem, was misprinted at the beginning as dead cheek, s-h-e-a-k, spear? James Mab, whoever he was, opened his dedicatory lines in the first folio by writing. We wondered, Shakespeare, that you went so soon from the world stage, to your grave's tiring room. We thought you dead, but this your printed worth, tells your spectators, that you went but forth to enter with applause. An actor's art, can die, and live, to act a second part. That is but an exit of mortality. This is a re entrance to applaud it. The poem clearly represents an impressive allegory, which can neither be understood nor interpreted, as long as one denies the Marlowe Shakespeare authorship thesis. With repeated reading, one discovers that the poem is a unique collection of contrarieties or contradictions between a living and a deceased person at the same time, characteristic for Marlowe. Consider that it is by no means assured that the initials in belong to a James Mab. Did Shakespeare really die so soon? Wouldn't one expect a poet in his twenties? How do you explain the fact, that seventeen years later, in 1640, Mab, explains flatly, that the dramatic poet doesn't need the witness of the name Shakespeare? This stunning statement in 1640 can only be understood, if we take the Marlowe Shakespeare authorship thesis for granted. Finally, John Warren's prefatory lines to Shakespeare's poem in 1640, without any doubt, fully disclose the authorship issue and their solution, summed up here, in a few significant phrases. Shakespeare again revived. Verbius like, thyself twice lived. The labors, his, the glory, to the other, William from Stratford. Learned poems amongst thy after birth, that is thy second life. 
in plain language. The poet was revived, lived a second time like Verbius, the Roman counterpart of Greek, Hippolytus, both narratives of a coming back to life. A perfect match to Christopher Marlowe, and not to Francis Bacon or the Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere, since Marlowe was slain and officially dead, but like Christ, had his resurrection, his second life.